And? <laughs> Hey, if we get started, we can finish. <laughs> All right, for this last section of the afternoon, we're going to have uh, the three academic papers. And again, I will point out that our practitioners are twice as valuable as our academics. That's clearly evident in the fact that they get twice as much time. So, we appreciate having the practitioners who are able to be here with us and now we're going to switch over to some academic papers. First is going to be Rachel Hayes um, talking about Sarbanes-Oxley and the fact that apparently people flee regulation. Okay, hopefully that's on. I know my value given that I have a half hour and in fact they talk, told me only to speak for 20 minutes so I know what I'm worth. Um, all right, so actually I should go back to my title because I changed it from what uh, I originally submitted to Lori and what's in the program and I, I, you, know, you probably don't know but I broadened it a little bit. It used to say going private decisions, now it says firms exits and um, you'll see why that is. It's because I've kind of also broadened what I'm talking about to include not just my own paper but two others. Um, so I'm going to do three papers in my 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to start with this quote from uh, Holmes and Kaplan, and you can see the date on that is 2003. Um, so this came out of a paper they wrote called uh, The State of U.S. Corporate Governance, What's Right and What's Wrong, or something like that. Um, and you can see from the fact that it's 2003, it was not long after Sarbanes-Oxley um, was, uh, was passed. And you know, basically these are just a couple of smart guys speculating on what Sarbanes-Oxley is likely to do. And so, you know, of course the overall effect not clear as of 2003, probably still not clear. Um, our guess is that the effect will be positive for companies with poor governance practices and negative for companies with good governance practices. At the margin this may lead some public companies to go private and deter some private companies from going public. And so, you know, this was their speculation. What happened ultimately is, is an empirical question. Um, I think this is how my presence here in some sense ties into the theme of the conference. I, um, those of you who know me know that I know absolutely nothing about valuation and so I'm not an obvious person to be at this conference, much less be standing up here. Um, but I, I, I see why Peter would have, uh, would have thought that this, this fits the, the theme of the, of the conference because what I'm going to be talking about is um, a, sort of a narrow piece of this, but how the set of firms that are publicly traded um, has been affected by Sarbanes-Oxley. And I'm going to talk a little bit about characteristics of, of those firms, but mostly I'm going to focus on the, the set of firms. And um, there are a lot of ways that we can look at that. Uh, I'm going to focus on this, this first one here um, relating to firms going private, but lots of researchers have, have started looking at these questions. Um, and so, you know, we can ask, do public firms go private? Um, we could also ask, do they engage in M&A transactions so uh, they get bought by other public firms? Um, we could also look at, do private firms stay private? Now, this is a really hard one because of the unobservability of firms choosing not to have an IPO. So that's a particularly difficult way to, to try to look at the set of firms um, effect, effects from SOX, but, uh, but that's certainly a question we'd like to know. Um, listing elsewhere. This one's a little bit easier, um, although still, you know, we, I don't think we can, we can quite nail it. Luigi Zingales has a paper that looks at the U.S. share of the global IPO market. And I think it was referred to in an earlier presentation today. Um, what he finds is that it's dropped quite a bit from 2000 to 2005. And so he explores a bunch of different explanations for why that might have been. And ultimately he concludes that it's probably a combination of other markets getting better and U.S. compliance costs. Um, we, um, there's supposed to be another bullet point there. Um, so, no there isn't. 
do firms remain publicly traded? <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Oh, no, no, that would have been my fault. I have this kind of clever way of, of making my notes appear, and I thought maybe I had made this thing disappear with my notes. Um, OK, so uh, do firms remain publicly traded, but do so in ways that evade SOX? Um, so this is, this is another way that we can, we can ask these questions. And I'll be talking a little bit about this first point here, moving to uh, or staying on the pink sheets. So um, the Lloyds et al. paper that I'm going to discuss uh, shortly talks about firms that choose to move to the pink sheets and stop filing uh, forms with the SEC. Um, Canceling or never beginning cross listings in the U.S. Last year's JAR conference, there was a paper about firms that uh, that stopped their uh, that deregistered their ADRs in response to Sarbanes Oxley. Um, several people in the audience have papers that relate to this. Surridge, Joe, I think Craig have things that relate to cross listings in the U.S. or listings in the U.S. compared to other markets. Um, this last one is a little bit of a different animal. Staying small in order to avoid compliance. Um, this is one that uh, that was at this year's JAR conference where um, the authors looked at whether firms were deliberately remaining small to avoid having to comply with SOX. And um, you know, this is something that, that presum presumably won't persist forever, but they find that, that firms seem to be trying to stay small, at least to avoid these, these costs in the meantime. OK, now, one thing I want to foc focus on in my talk today is that there are a lot of difficulties in doing research in this area. And the, the two biggies, I think, relate to control groups and the fact that there are a lot of ways to, to get around Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, the control groups thing, I think, is, is the, the primary issue. Um, we'd like to find a control group when we're, do, when we're asking these kinds of questions because um, there's a lot of stuff that's gone on in capital markets recently. Um, for example, the rise in private equity. Um, it also seems like the organizational form private has gained in popularity. And so if there's just a general trend towards going private, we don't want to attribute that to Sarbanes-Oxley instead of what it's really due to. And so ideally, we'd have some kind of a control group that wasn't affected by Sarbanes-Oxley that allows us to test this. The difficulty, of course, is that any control group that we have is necessarily going to be quite different. We know that, that if a firm isn't affected by Sarbanes-Oxley, it's fundamentally different from the firms that are affected. Maybe it's because it's foreign. Maybe it's because it's small and only trades on the pink sheets. But we know that these are a different set of firms for one reason or another, and that's why they're not affected by Sarbanes-Oxley. So the control group thing, I think, is, is quite a big deal. And, and we'll talk about that as, we, as I go through this. Um, and the other one here is many ways to avoid SOX compliance. Um, as I talk here, I'll talk about going private, and I'll talk about uh, about going dark is two possibilities. I mentioned earlier uh, mergers and acquisitions. So um, by focusing on one response, we may miss the effects of others. Having said that, you know, there's only so much you can do in one paper. And so um, that's not to say that you know, we shouldn't at least look at these particular paths firms take. Okay, so I mentioned I was going to talk about uh, three papers, and the first one is, is my own paper with uh, Ellen Engel and Sue Wang. Um, the second one I'll talk about is Christian Leutz's paper with Triantis and Wang, that's a different Wang. Um, and then the last one is one that you're probably less familiar with. Um, two of these Two of these authors are law school professors. Um, uh, I know that at least Eric Talley, the third one, also has a PhD in economics. And although this is completely irrelevant, it's a little bit curious. He lived across the street from me in, as I grew up in small town New Mexico. So, uh, so at any rate, I'm going to talk about these three papers. And you'll see that they take different approaches to kind of addressing the same fundamental set of questions. OK, so the first one that, uh, that I'll talk about is my own. And um, the, the primary reason I'll talk about it first is because it was the first one that was, I'm not sure if it was written first, but it, it was published first. And I, I think that the other two papers provide, they build on what we did there and provide some improvements in, in certain directions. So we looked at 470 going private transactions between 1998 and May of 2005. Now, we defined our sample on the basis of uh, Schedule 13E3 filings. So this was the SEC's definition of going private, and that is that when the firm reduces its shareholders to below 300 and uh, 
is no longer to re required to file reports with the SEC. So that was our definition of going private. And these transactions are a very specific kind of transaction because firms file this Schedule 13E3, which describes the transaction, also talks about other options that the firm might have considered, talks about whether the directors, uh, particularly the independent directors, were in favor of it, and basically gives a lot of information. And as we'll see, it it seems like this is quite valuable for shareholders. Getting this information and having firms go through the process of you know, figuring out, describing what they've done as part of this transaction. So that's how we defined our sample. Um, and we do a number of things in the paper, but really the, what I want to focus on are just these two, um, these two parts of it, where we compare the pre and post SOX rate of these transactions, and we look at the uh, firm level characteristics that predict the market response to these announcements. So um, as far as results go, uh, we find an increase in the Schedule 13E3 filings um, after Sarbanes-Oxley and um, you know, as far as numbers we have 159 in the 33 months before, 243 in roughly the same period afterwards. Um, we can do this graphically. So uh, this is not quite the same numbers that I have up here. These are the by quarter numbers. Um, so you know, you can see what the, there's this kind of increase here. We put SOX in in 2002. And then if you want to look at the pre and post means, um, we have, I think, 12.4 uh, is the, the per quarter mean beforehand. And 22.2 is the per quarter mean afterwards. And those are different, statistically different from each other. And so when you look at that, you know, it looks like we've seen an increase in going private transactions since Sarbanes-Oxley. So that's our first result. Our second result is that uh, we also saw changes in how the firm characteristics predicted the market response. And in particular, what we found, and this is a little bit difficult to say so that people can understand it, so I'm going to put up a, a table on the next page. Um, smaller firms with greater inside ownership see higher going private announcement returns in the post SOX period compared to the pre SOX period. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to put up a, a, little, a little picture here. Now, we ran a um, we ran a, a regression, and, and this is the result of a triple interaction. And so, rather than, than putting up the regression and explaining the triple interaction, I'm just going to do this little two by two here. Um, so this is the percentage point effect on the abnormal returns from a 10 percentage point increase in manager and director ownership. Right? So we increase insider ownership by 10 percentage points. What does that do to the abnormal return? Um, from the going private announcement. Okay, so large firms are here in this example the 75th percentile, small firms are the 25th percentile. So for large firms before SOX, if there was a 10 percentage point increase in insider ownership, um, the, the uh, abnormal return was higher by 0.6. Uh, percentage points and afterwards lower by 0.9. For small firms, we see a, a rather big difference. Before Sarbanes-Oxley, there was a 1.8 percentage point decrease or lower by 1.8 percentage points and afterwards higher by 1.2. Okay, so what we're seeing is that it looks like small firms that had concentrated ownership, specifically the insiders, had a more positive response to going private. Now, our interpretation of this in the paper, and um, you know, we can we can certainly come up with alternatives, is that this is consistent with what Holmstrom and Kaplan were speculating, were saying, is that that small firms. Um, this is greeted more positively for small firms and in particular those that have high insider ownership. If you think that high inside ownership means interests of shareholders and managers are aligned, then this indicates potentially good governance. Now I recognize governance is notoriously difficult to, to measure, so there are a lot of other ways you can, can interpret this, but I think there is definitely scope for interpreting this as being consistent with Holmstrom and Kaplan's speculation. Firms with good governance that, uh, that are small have a, a more positive response to going private. Okay. Now, um, strengths and weaknesses. All right, and you can decide which you think are strengths and which you think are weaknesses. Um, so first of all, our sample selection was similar to the earlier literature on going private. We used these 13E3 filings as our, as our um, 
the way we defined our sample, so our results are comparable to some of the earlier going private literature. Um, second one, hard to identify a control group of firms that was not affected by Sarbanes-Oxley. So if we go back and we look at this picture here, in, if instead of drawing these two lines that look quite different, if I had drawn a trend line, then you know, what would your conclusion be? Your conclusion might be, gee, it looks like firms are going private more, and it happens to be the case that this happened around Sarbanes-Oxley. So, um, you know, having a group of control firms that weren't affected by Sarbanes-Oxley would be particularly helpful here because then we could determine, was it a single event or was this just that more firms are leaving the public capital markets because there's more private equity out there or whatever. All right, we can't conclude that, I think, from, from our study. Um, and the last point here, most sample firms cease trading, but they can avoid Sarbanes-Oxley by deregistering. Okay, now this is going to lead me into the Lloyds et al. paper. We have some firms in our sample um, in this group here that filed a 13E3 but continued to trade on the pink sheets afterwards. Now, our multivariate results aren't affected by this, so we still come to the same, come to the same conclusions for everything else. But when we look at this difference between the pre and post SOX mean, that's driven by these firms, which we call going dark firms, because they stop filing, but they continue to trade. And that suggests that it's probably worth taking a look at these going dark firms to see if there's something going on there. And so that's exactly what Christian and his co-authors did in their paper, and this came out the following year. Um, in the JA conference. So they've got 484 going dark firms and they're sort of roughly the same um, time period as we have. And the way that they define their sample is firms that deregistered but continue to trade. Okay, so you can deregister once you get below 300 shareholders of record. And so that's what their firms did. Some of them had to get their number of shareholders below 300, but a lot of them were already there and just chose to file the papers and say, all right, we're done. Okay, so they also compare the pre and post SOX rates of their transactions and they look at what firm level characteristics predict the going dark decision and also the abnormal, um, the market response to that decision and whether those have changed since, uh, since Sarbanes-Oxley. Okay, so what do they find? Well, they find an increase in the monthly frequency of deregistrations after Sarbanes-Oxley. I didn't get, I don't have the monthly number, so these are just annual. Um, we draw the SOX line in and, you know, it's pretty dramatic. Like this one, you're going to have a harder time drawing your, your trend line here, although you could still try. And I'll, and I'll talk again about the, the lack of a control sample. But it's a pretty big increase, and it sure looks like there's, a, there's been an increase in deregistrations since Sarbanes-Oxley happened. Okay, what else do they find? Well, um, they find a negative market reaction to going dark. I didn't, I think I didn't mention um, when I talked about going private, we find a positive reaction to that. So they find a negative reaction and when they look at uh, firms' propensity to go dark, the firms that, are, that tend to go dark are ones that are in financial distress or have poor growth prospects and they measure this in a number of ways but for example asset growth, if you have low asset growth that tends to predict going dark. So this means potentially that what we're getting from these firms that are going dark is we're getting a piece of information that says these guys may not need capital in the future and so not surprisingly the market reacts negatively to this. Um, they also find some evidence that agency costs explain going dark and so they, um, without explaining in much detail because I don't really understand it, they, um, they calculate a measure of free cash flow problems and they find that those free cash flow problems predict going dark and in particular that that variable is more important after Sarbanes-Oxley. Okay. They also find that some of their distress variables or their, their low growth prospect variables change before and after. So bankruptcy is more important before, but asset growth is more important after. So um, there's not, um, it's, it's, I think it's, it's very clear that there are more transactions afterwards. Um, there's some evidence that there were agency costs attributable to the, the post SOX transactions. And then as far as distress goes, there's a little bit of evidence on for both pre and post SOX being influenced by that. <coughs> 
Okay. Now, as I mentioned, when we look at this picture, it is pretty stark. I mean, we see a fairly, a fairly big jump here. But again, we don't know for sure that this is due to Sarbanes-Oxley. The uh, about that means five minutes. minutes. Time for I thought you were telling me to stop. No. Don't come any closer. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so the, the authors of this paper do a lot to try to rule out alternative explanations. They put in market performance over the past year. They put in indicate. They put in um, time trends in case uh, to to measure whether it's gotten easier to go dark over time. So they really try to rule out that this is just a trend here, but. We don't know for sure that it's that firms just started going dark and continue to go dark more um, after Sarbanes-Oxley. So this leads me to my the last paper I'm going to talk about, and this is the KKT paper, um, and the motivation that they provide in their paper is that that we need a control group, and they give a couple of examples of factors that uh, that. Um, that might lead more firms to go private or go dark. Um, so for example, if uh, stock prices are depressed, we might expect to see more of these transactions. Um, if there's more capital available, we also might expect to see more of these transactions. That's probably more relevant go for going private than for going dark transactions. And so what they do is they take a very different approach to addressing this question. So they look at all acquisitions between 2000 and 2004 involving targets traded on public exchanges. Um, so, uh, so they look at both American and foreign targets. And so their, their starting sample is just any publicly traded firm that's getting acquired. All right. They're doing a difference and difference design where they compare, and I'm going to probably have to read this a couple of times because it's, it takes, a, at least for me, a little while to soak in exactly what they're doing. The post SOX change in the probability of American public firms that are undergoing acquisitions being acquired by a private firm. Okay, so remember, they're looking at the set of firms undergoing acquisitions and they want to know how does the probability that if you're one of these firms undergoing an acquisition, how does the probability that you're being acquired by a private firm rather than a public firm change before and after SOX? Okay? And so they're looking at that and they're comparing it to the corresponding change in probability for foreign firms. All right? So this is their difference in deference methodology. And they also at the same time are able to control for the level of stock prices in a listing country. So I'm going to talk fast because I want to get through this. Um, the advantages and disadvantages of their research design. Um, first of all, they compare the U.S. to other countries which presumably are less affected, have less direct effects from Sarbanes-Oxley. Now, this is a nice idea, but of course it depends, how successful you are depends on whether we think that these probabilities would have tracked each other in, the changes in probability would have tracked each other in the absence of Sarbanes-Oxley. And so, you know, that's, that's it, it's nice to have a control group, but we have to believe that it has the right characteristics. Um, the other thing that they do here is they contrast the going private transactions with acquisitions by public acquirers. All right, so their definition of going private is you get bought by a private company. And so, Again, this has a nice aspect to it because it provides a control for uh, firms' willingness to do acquisitions. So the, the availability of capital. If there's more capital out there, both public firms and private firms presumably are doing more acquisitions. So it allows us to get it at that control as well. Now, some disadvantages. Well, we don't get the going dark firms. That's not necessarily such a big deal because we can look at those separately, but it does mean that you know, maybe we don't find anything with this methodology. It could be that the reason we don't find anything is because all the action is in going dark firms, but that doesn't mean there's no effect from Sarbanes-Oxley. It just means there's no effect here. So we don't get everybody when we look at this. Um, it also turns out that the way they've defined this, uh, that they're going private transactions, doesn't even capture all going private transactions. So for example, self-tenders aren't included here. So maybe all the actions in self-tenders and going private, but even so, you know, we're, we're at least getting some ca comparisons here. And then the other thing about this research design is that it doesn't get at firm-specific factors. So in both of the other two papers, um, we looked at a lot of different firm-specific factors like, um, you know, the Lloyd's paper, financial distress. Um, uh, asset growth, that sort of thing. So these guys don't pick up any of that stuff in, in their paper, which simply means that 
we're not going to be able to come to, to much in the way of conclusions about whether these are good firms or bad firms that are going private. But again, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to do that. It just means we can't draw those conclusions here. Okay, so what do they find? Well, when they look at American firms overall, they don't find any relative increase in the post stocks rate of acquisition by private acquirers. And again, that's their language or that's their methodology for going private. Acquisition by private acquirers is going private. No relative increase in, in that. But when they focus on small American firms, they do find a relative increase. And when, they, when they, they further explore this, they find that this increase is concentrated in the first year after Sarbanes-Oxley. So we get more American firms going private, but only the small ones. And that effect is, most, is, is pretty much the first year after Sarbanes-Oxley. Okay, so um, this is their, their table one, so it's not their multivariate analysis, but you can kind of get an idea if I explain to you what it is, what's going on here. So what they've done here is this is just describing their sample. And so for example, percent small targets, U.S. pre-stocks. This tells us that of the firms that were acquired in the U.S. before Sarbanes-Oxley, 22% of them were small and they define small as bottom quartile of, of their, um, their market, their, where, where they're traded. So when they do their difference in difference, the numbers that they're looking at are from in the US, the percentage of private acquirers among small targets. So of the small targets that are being acquired, 40% of them are acquired by private firms before Sarbanes-Oxley. Afterwards, that number of the small firms that are being acquired, they're now being acquired, 54% of them are by private firms. So the going private rate has gone sort of, this is loosely saying this, from 40 to 54%. When we look at the foreign firms, it's gone from 45 to 46. So that's the difference in difference that they're doing. And this is what they're picking up, is that the rate of small firms being acquired by private acquirers going private has jumped quite a bit for US compared to what happened in the rest of the world. OK, so some conclusions. And uh, so broadly speaking, I think the evidence does support Holmstrom and Kaplan's conjectures. All three studies seem to find that small firms uh, were exiting the, the capital market. Um, my paper with Ellen and Sue finds what we interpret as evidence that, uh, that firms with good governance were greeted, uh, that the news that they were going private was viewed as a, as a positive thing. Um, uh, methodological problems remain. Do I think we've solved the, that we've answered this with certainty? No, we still have this control group issue. I think that the the, the uh, KKT paper does a nice job in coming up with the control group, but I think there are still reasons we can question um, whether we have the perfect control group, and we certainly never will. Um, and then finally, can we say whether Sarbanes-Oxley is good or bad from this evidence? You know, of course, what I'm going to say here is that we can't answer this question. I think what we can say. Um, what we can say from, from this evidence is that um, it looks like some firms were leaving. It looks like in the case of going dark firms, it may have been firms that there were some potentially some agency problems. In the case of going private firms, they may have been good firms. But even if it turns out that all the firms that left are good firms, does that mean Sarbanes-Oxley's bad? No, we have to weigh that against, of course, any beneficial effects for the firms that stay. OK, so I only went over by eight minutes. <laughs> Do we have a question or two? Jeff? Oh, sorry. I'm not allowed to do that. I was just wondering, I thought you mentioned that, uh, I don't know if there's some papers, but are firms managing the, uh, their uh, uh, market capitalization to get out of doing like the 404, not being an accelerated filer? Yeah, that's the paper from, uh, that's Gao Wu and Zimmerman paper that was in this year's JAR conference. Uh, and what do they find? And uh, what they find is that it looks like firms are trying to stay below that $75 million threshold um, to, to keep from having to comply with SOX. And they, you know, they further look at specific actions that they take, both to lower the stock price and <coughs> get rid of the shares. Hi, Rich. I was just thinking here, it's, uh, it's weird to give a suggestion about a paper that none of the authors are in, are in here. On the yeah, third paper. you know, I was thinking about that too. Yeah, but well, but anyway, like uh, one thing that I was thinking here is that your paper and the paper of Christian is 
it's voluntary decision. So you choose to go dark or you choose to go private. And in this last paper, it's uh, you are a target here. Do they show any evidence that they are more like, say, it's less likely to be a hostile takeover or they are willing to sell for a lower premium or something like that? You know, they don't provide any information about any of that. There's no discussion about whether these are hostile takeovers or, um, or, or not. And I, my, you know, I, I, I suspect there's a mix, but mostly they're not hostile. Because that would be very, like, say, similar to, like, I mean, in your paper, Christian suggests the firms are willing to do this and they are willing to select. Yeah, know, although I think nice even in even in our sample, it's not obvious that some of those weren't hostile because we have, you know, we have um, transactions where some, you know, a private firm buys another firm, and so some of those could have been hostile as well. And you know, they 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 get classified as going private because the firm that ultimately ends up owning them is private. But we don't know for sure that those weren't hostile in in our sample as well. Let's take and go ahead on to Steve's paper, and thank you very much, Rachel. Thank the Peter and the organizers for inviting me to present this my work. Uh, I'm going to, like Greg mentioned, I want to just talk about some issues related to analyst coverage around cross listings, and with an eye towards what kind of questions we can answer uh, when we look at the analysts around cross listings. Before I dive into the research question, let me just give you an idea of the data that I'm working with. The academic literature and the popular press, they focus on listings in the US and UK, and rightly so. The bulk of the listings are in those two countries. Uh, however, many firms, as we've seen in some other papers presented today, cross-list on other exchanges. And what I hope to find by looking at a sample with other cross-listings, or what I hope to do, is to answer some important questions in the literature. So I utilize a sample which includes cross listings from many different exchanges up through the year 2004. Now this sample was origina originally collected by a couple of finance professors, Sergei Sarkissian and Michael Schill, and they have two papers based on it, and I'll talk a little bit about what they find. But it includes over 3,500 cross listings. And so let me give you just a picture. Here are the cross listings by host country, and I haven't shown the on the, I haven't shown the maximum number of observations for the U.S. It's well above 600, but you see that the U, in the U.K. or GBR, Great Britain, approaching 500. But besides those two markets, you'll see that there are many exchanges in Europe which ex, which attract a sizable number of listings: Belgium, uh, CHE is Switzerland, uh, Germany, France, Luxembourg, and then even beyond Europe, there are some. Um, Pacific Rim exchanges like Australia, the first one listed there, uh, Japan and New Zealand, which attract listings. Now one thing that of course I haven't shown you and I think what masks some of the richness of this data set is I'm not showing you where these firms are coming from, only that they list on a variety of different host exchanges. So what I've done here is I've shown the most, I've shown the host, the home countries where we see most of these listings happening. And I think there are some interesting patterns, but first of all, as you can see, there are many Canadian firms, uh, firms from Germany, France, and the United States also has several firms that list abroad. But what, was, what I think is interesting here is if you look within the home host country pairs, you'll notice that there are some interesting clusters. So for instance, the, this one we know about Canada, most of the cross listings are in the US. If you look at Australian firms, a lot of them list in New Zealand, that's where the bulk of those listings come from. You can see those, and you see some geographic clusters among these different home and host countries. Another interesting thing is if you look at Luxembourg, Luxembourg actually tends to attract Asian firms, so several from India, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. And So there's some interesting patterns that you can see in this data which I think reflect many, there are many different reasons why firms cross-list. Um, 
And so the other thing I wanted to talk about is the listing requirements in these different exchanges. So we know the US and the UK have some of the strictest in the world, particularly on those primary exchanges, the AIM notwithstanding. But what about the listing requirements in these other host markets? The easiest way to think about this is if you're familiar with the listing requirements in London on the main exchange versus AIM, that's probably pretty representative of these other host markets. Many exchanges allow foreign firms to list on a secondary market or as an exempt foreign listing. To give you a couple examples, uh, in Australia, the Australian Stock Exchange allows these exempt foreign listings and the requirements are lower for these foreign firms. They still have to, to file with the, the regulator in Australia, but the I'll talk a little bit about the, the filing requirements. And then take Japan, for instance, is another uh, exchange. The Tokyo Stock Exchange has several different uh, markets. They stratify their markets and they have different listing requirements. And most of the foreign firms end up on those markets where the listing requirements aren't as stringent. Now, relative to actual financial reporting requirements, many exchanges operate under this mutual recognition policy. And what that means is the host country exchange simply requires the firm to deliver its financial statements from the home country in the native language of the host country. Uh, in Australia's case, they simply require the firm to deliver the annual report and anything that they disclose in the home country in the host country. And what that means then is if you're thinking about FSA with these f financial statement analysis with these firms is when you see the numbers reported in most of these host countries, they are what's reported in the home country. Now this is less of an issue nowadays given that most firms, a lot of firms are reporting under IFRS. And IFRS is typically accepted on all of these exchanges without any reconciliation. So what I, what I hope to do then is with this variation in host country institutions. I'm going to look at that variation and relate it to changes in analyst coverage to shed light on what's known as the bonding hypothesis that's been alluded to by some other presenters. More particularly, what I'm interested in doing is trying to answer, trying to find out whether market forces are legal inst or legal institutions or together whether these allow firms to bond. And so let me, I'm going to talk about two things. The first is why I think I'm going to motivate this question and then I'll talk about why I use analyst coverage in this setting. So quickly the bonding hypothesis states that firms from countries with weak legal institutions have a hard time raising external capital. And it's been suggested that firms can overcome this problem when they cross list in a host exchange that has institutions that deter managers from expropriation. Of course, the U.S. is the prime example of that. Doi, or, I'm sorry, uh, Coffee and Stoltz were some of the first to kind of recommend this or suggest this hypothesis, and they list several institutional requirements. So disclosure requirements, legal system, the legal system, regulation, and market forces. They actually suggest that market forces are a way for firms to bond. Now, in this, in my paper, I make a distinction between what I cl classify legal institutions and then market forces. And the reason I make that distinction is if you look at most of the papers that try to test whether firms bond when they cross list, they focus on legal institutions, but there's some research that questions whether or not legal instance institutions can do the job. And the reason for that is that U.S. exchanges often waive some of the governance provisions that are required for uh, domestic firms. Firms cross-listed in the U.S. Don't, are exempt from filing proxy statements. They don't have to comply with insider trading restrictions or Reg FD. And then more broadly, there's this issue of mutual recognition. If they're not reconciling any financial statements, it may not, these legal institutions may not bite in the, home, in the host country. And so what I try to, evaluate, try to look at is whether market forces can fill this void and work in conjunction with legal institutions to bond firms. Now the other important piece that I need to, to discuss is uh, just talk about how I actually view market forces. How do I operationalize them in my study? Now the way I view them is these market forces are fundamental characteristics of a country's financial structure. And I look at two dimensions of the financial structure. First, what, what is the principal means of dispensing capital? Is it through the equity market or through debt? And then I look at ownership structure at the country level, the average ownership structure. And I argue that these forces can affect reporting incentives even when actual rules and regulations aren't there to 
enforce disclosure. And the reason for that is if you look in countries where st with strong equity markets and or diffuse ownership, the only way investors get to know about, can have information in those settings is through public disclosures. Typically it's disseminated through public disclosure. And there's some anecdotal evidence in the US that US cross-listed firms, even though they're not subject to something like Reg FD, they still comply with it. And I've listed a couple firms here, Nokia and TV Azteca, where they comply with Reg FD even though they're not required to. Now, what I do then is I, I measure these legal institutional variables and these market force variables using some, some of the common variables that are seen in the literature. I have some disclosure indices. I look at an anti-director rights index. Uh, judicial efficiency, whether or not the firm is located in a common law or code law country, a public regulation index. And for my market force variables, I look at the size of the equity market and then whether or not it's more bank based or, or market equity based. And then I look at ownership concentration at the country level. And what I do is I look at the host country institution relative to the strength of the home country institution. And the results that I'll show you, I create indicator variables that I prefix by IND to denote those observations where the host country institution is stronger than the home country institution. Now the next important thing is why do I use analyst coverage? Why is analyst coverage a good variable uh, to look at? Well in, in bonding studies what what researchers try to do is they try to find a variable that shows that firm to try to capture whether or not a firm is better off after it's listed than before. And so I motivate my use of analyst coverage based on the fact that it's a measure of a firm's information environment. And there's some work by Langlands and Miller that look at analyst coverage in a US cross-listing setting that motivate it similarly. And the reason an in information environment the information environment is important is it can lower the cost of monitoring the firm and limit the expropriation of cash flows. And so if we see the information environment improving after the listing, hopefully investors are better off. And my main variable in this case is what I list here as DCOV. It's simply the change in coverage from six months before the listing to six months after. And I adjust it for things, one, one of the things I adjust it for is to get around this issue of coverage in IBIS increasing over time, I adjust it for the median increase in coverage at a given home country. And then I simply associate changes in coverage with my legal institutions and market force variables. And my hypotheses are fairly simple. If legal institutions are leading to this bonding effect, I would expect legal institutions to be associated with positive changes in analyst coverage. And the same goes for market forces. If market forces are leading to this effect, I expect to find a positive relation between changes in coverage and market forces. Now there are several caveats to this study. First of all, if you think about why firms cross-list, there are many different reasons. In fact, bonding, we know, isn't the only reason that firms may cross-list. And if you look at my sample, some of the things we talked about in terms of clustering, it's obvious that you know, firms from Australia may not be listing in New Zealand to, to bond. It may be more related to geography, um, culture, and that's what one of the Sarkissian and Schill studies looks at. They show that a lot of it is determined by proximity, just ge geographic proximity. Also, if you think about just um, arguments related to reducing barriers to investment and increasing the investor base, trying to improve the attention that you get in a given market, uh, issuing equity, firms may issue equity and along with that oftentimes in most cases analyst coverage comes with that. And then some other people have referred to accessing the expertise of foreign analysts in a given market. And so these and other things can affect analyst coverage. One of the other problems I face is it's hard to separate market forces from legal institutions. They're endogenous they're in many, they're endogenous and so I'm going to talk about one test where I try to get around this issue. Before I jump into showing you some of the multivariate analysis, let me just show you what coverage looks like, the change in analyst coverage looks like across several different host countries. And keep in mind, this is adjusted for the median change in coverage and that's why you can see some, uh, so for instance, the min is not a round number. I'm adjusting it for the median change at a given, in a given home country. But for instance, firms that list in France, you see a positive in increase in coverage. Same for Great Britain, 
uh, Japan, and so across several of the host markets that I capture, analyst coverage increases. Okay, and this, the increase in coverage has been documented in the UK and in the US. But as far as these other markets, this paper shows that it's actually fairly widespread across different host countries. Okay? So what I do is I take these changes in coverage and I build a model of analyst coverage based on several variables. And if you look in the literature, there's not a whole lot of literature that actually provides some theory about why analysts cover certain firms. It's typically based on arguments about what are the costs and benefits analysts come up against when they're trying to choose which firms to follow. But I model this change in coverage as, as a function of prior existing coverage, so the log of coverage before the listing, the log of the return over that same time frame where I measure the change in coverage, the change in size, market to book ratio as proxies for growth. And then also I, I include an indicator variable of whether or not the firm's issuing equity when it cross lists. And then finally I include one of my institutional variables to try to get at how market forces and legal institutions affect this change in coverage. <coughs> so the first table I want to show is table five, panel B, and it's simply, the model got cut off a little bit up there. Uh, but what I'm doing here is I'm including each of those institutional variables that I showed you individually in the model. And the results for those institutional variables are here, but let me quickly talk about, if you look at, this is prior coverage, firms that list, that have a lot of coverage already, tend to get fewer, a, a smaller increase in coverage when they list, which is not surprising. Firms that issue equity also, this shows that they get more analyst coverage when they list. But what the, my hypotheses predict that the sign on the institutional variables for these legal variables is positive. And in most cases it is, but it's only significant in one in the case of judicial efficiency. Suggesting that the efficiency of the judicial sy system increases analyst coverage, improves the information environment around a cross-listing. Now the rest of this table looks at the market force variables. And I show that so the, the prediction is the same here. I, accept, I expect a positive sign on these coefficients. And I find that when the market is bigger in the host country than in the home country, it attract, they, firms that list in those host countries attract one, approximately one more analyst. Same for whether the, the system is more equity based than bank based. And when firms list in countries with more dispersed ownership, they attract more coverage. Relative, remember this is all relative to the home country, the strength of the, the institution in the home country. Now, as I mentioned, one of the problems I face is separating legal institutions from market forces. And some of the other papers in the table I actually include these jointly and get fairly consistent results. But one of the things I wanted to try to do was to just simply say, okay, let's, we know that they're related, but if you take two markets like the US and the UK, where it can be argued that the legal institutions that are actually applied to foreign firms are stronger in the US, but the market, force, the market forces are fairly, they're more comparable across these different markets. Both are very large equity markets, very liquid. Um, and so I'm trying to hold market forces constant and let legal forces vary in terms of the US is stronger than, than the UK. And if legal institutions are driving this change, then I expect firms that list in the US to attract more coverage. And so when I do that, and I include simply an indicator variable for US listed firms, the sign is actually negative, but it's not significant. Um, so there's no evidence to suggest that firms that list in the US versus those that list in the U UK attract any more analysts. And so it can't, this, this suggests that it can't just be legal institutions, that there may be other things like market forces going on. So, five minutes, all right, I'm done actually. So, <laughs> um, let me just say a couple things in conclusion. So, I, I think what, this, what my paper shows is that analyst coverage, this phenomenon of analyst coverage increasing in the US and the UK is actually widespread in several different host markets, suggesting that the information environment itself shifts around cross-listing in other markets. And the increase in coverage is concentrated in host countries with strong market forces, but there's also evidence that legal institutions do play a role in bonding managers when they cross-list in trying to deter expropriation. That's it, thanks. <laughs>
questions? You know what I think would be uh, really interesting too, if you could, um, something we used to always get when we wrote those um, first couple of papers was, you know, where's the analyst from, right? Is it a yeah. local analyst, is it a foreign an analyst? And we'd always just punt and say, you know, we can't get that, that information. But I think, you know, Renee Stoltz has a recent paper that actually has a nice way to identify whether they're local or foreign analysts. And it would be really interesting, I think, to see, you know, this change in coverage, you know, what drives whether it's a local analyst versus a, a foreign analyst. And weaving that in might make some of the uh, you know, stuff really interesting as well. Yeah. And so I, this is actually a great point. And I went down the road of trying to get some of this data that the, there's a Stoltz paper and there's also a, a Welker paper and a couple of the co-authors in it. Queen's University. The problem is when you look and you try to get the data for some of the most of the firms I have, um, it's just not available. You end up only identifying analyst location in about 40 or 50 percent of the observations. So, um, yeah, it would be great to know that. In fact, one of the things that I've thought about is maybe not getting to that level just because the data is not there, but thinking about documenting how the analysts that are actually new at the cross-listing versus those that are existing. And maybe that could say something about this type of thing. Yeah. Okay. I'm going that way first. All right. Uh, I have two small questions. Sure. Uh, the first one, I wasn't clear whether you control for size. Do you control for size, firm size? And the reason I ask that is if in the action of cross-listing the firm has merged with another firm and there was a uh, process of the firm growing in size, there is mm. evidence that analyst coverage increases with size. Yeah, and if you look, these firms are huge firms that I end up actually having the data for in my sample. So I have both looked at the level, the size before cross-listing, right. and in the results I report here, it's actually the change in size, so it's growth. But I have looked at whether the level affects the actual change in coverage, right. and the re results are robust to including something like that. And the other question dawned on me today was whether over time there has been uh, changes in the, let's say, the productivity of analysts. That is, they cover more, so that is, they spend less time. Um, uh, I mean, this is really a, a, an experimental um, question. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's possible to find the number of firms that are being covered by, uh, by a single analyst and control for that. Yeah, you can, I can definitely do that. Um, the data is there in IBIS to be able to know how many firms each one of these analysts is covering. And it's, act, so it's the subject of some other analyst studies, so I could definitely try to control for that and look at, related to the point made before, if I know which ones are actually new when they start these, this change in coverage. Are these analysts that already are covering a lot of different firms? Do they maintain coverage for a year, for two years, and look at how they're changing after that? Uh, I'm just trying to figure out what maintained assumption there is in here about um, the propensity of managers to expropriate and therefore the need for managers to uh, bond, for good guys to bond. Mm -hmm. Are you assuming that the propensity is constant across uh, countries? Um, so the propensity to expropriate, essentially. Right. So that's a good question. I mean, I don't think, explicitly I don't make any assumptions about that, but the implicit assumption may be that it's constant across countries. Um, so I haven't, no, I don't, I don't address that in the paper, but that's a good point. I mean, I should... Because the causality could run the other way around. Institutions may be endogenous and depend upon the propensity to be, to cheat, right? Yeah. And the if uh, relatively weak institutions are associated with cultures where the propensity to cheat is, is lower, your results would flow through. Bearing in mind you, this is a cross-border yeah. presentation, uh, I'm interested in, you know, whether this is uh, necessarily true or not. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I, so when the bonding literature talks about the, how willing a firm is to bond or what are the costs or how willing they are to expropriate, one of the things that it's often tied to is to inside ownership. Right? So the more inside ownership that a firm, that managers have, or 
the controlling shareholders, the less incentive they have to bond because they're giving up more in that case. Now I only have limited data on inside ownership, but I have looked at whether the actual ownership level at the firm level. So to the extent that inside ownership captures this notion of willingness to expropriate, I've tried to control for that to include this ownership data. It's just not there for a lot of my firms. It's very limited. But the results do go through when I try to control for the, with the data that I have. I mean, I suppose what, what's in the back of my mind here is a more general point, which is that a lot of this institutional, legal institutional research um, seems to have behind it uh, an assumption that um, you know, the, the common law, high, high litigation environments are kind of better, good, and that the weaker code law uh, environments are worse. But then there's a, there's a gap in the literature. I, I'm aware of no research which shows, for example, that the, the incidence of expropriation, the incidence of big accounting frauds or other corporate frauds mm -hmm. is, is higher in the weaker environments. In fact, probably the evidence, the anecdotal evidence will point to exactly the opposite result. Yeah, and I think, so maybe I understand your question a little bit better. Relative to your first point, the, explit, the assumption I make when I construct those indicator variables, I mean, is that, right? I'm assuming that a common law legal system is better than a code law. So yeah, that, that assumption is very clear in the data. Um, but relative to your second point, you're right. I mean, I don't think, um, I think in general, if you look, I know at least there's the, the Lloyds et al. study that looks at these legal institutional variables and how earnings management on several dimensions changes. So, and they find that typically earnings management is lower in, in countries with better institutions. Oh, hi, Steve. I have another yeah. question. So, What's your take on choosing the change in analyst forecast as the dependent variable to look at? Because if your research question is looking at the market force versus the legal institution, the analyst forecast, I mean, the analyst following will be like a strongly driven by the market forces. So I mean, I'm not surprised that you know in your results the market force variables come out uh, stronger. So I'm saying, like, what's your take on take giving the research question you're asking? So what's the motivation to choose the analyst for coverage as the dependent variable? Yeah, and this so some of the caveats I mentioned definitely not all of them, but there are there is this issue of you know, hey, some markets just have more analysts. Right? And the fact that it goes up in countries where ownership is, dif is diffuse and the equity market's bigger isn't surprising. Um, I do try to, to control for that. I include a variable that captures the average level of coverage in a given host country to try to get at this issue. But you're right, it doesn't remove um, all the concerns there are with analyst coverage. Um, as far as your point about the um, analyst forecast, for instance, just how accurate they are. So I went down this road a little bit um, and some preliminary results actually showed that there was no change in coverage, or excuse me, not no change in coverage, but no change in the accuracy. Um, and there could be several reasons for that, and one of those is if the information environment is changing around a cross-listing, it just may be harder for analysts to guess at or try to, to figure out what the firm's earnings are going to be. So yeah, I did look at, at coverage. There didn't seem to be any indication, I did look at forecast accuracy, and there didn't seem to be any indication that it was uh, changing one way or the other. Craig will be our last question, and then we'll go on to Joe. Okay. This is sort of a question and maybe a suggestion. Sure. Is there any reason why you don't look at outcomes, right? So you're showing us that there's an increase in analyst coverage and in certain countries, and you're using that to distinguish between the role of market forces and legal institutions. Why not look at outcomes, right? You have countries where the host market has legal institutions that come into play and and market forces through analysts, and you have countries where the host market has no legal institutions but has analysts playing a role, right? So yeah. one way to pick, pick your conclusion apart or provide additional evidence would be to say, okay, let's look at some kind of outcome variable that has relevance for additional monitoring. So for, and then relating that to the change in coverage. Right, and distinguishing between countries where market forces and legal institutions matter versus countries where just market forces matter. Come into play. Uh, and that's a good suggestion. And we can, yeah, I'd like to get your in, insight on maybe some suggested variables on that. Thank you very much, Steve. All right.
this on your belt. Is that where that's going? Yeah. Seems like he's got it. And an attempt to keep it interesting, because for some of you it's probably the middle of the night. For some of you it's probably the middle of the morning, depending on how far we've traveled. Um, our last speaker is going to be Joe Piotr Piotrowski, and he's actually not going to directly talk about a paper, but he's more going to talk about valuation in emerging markets, which is my understanding roughly based on a class that he teaches. So it's going to be a little bit different of a take to keep us engaged. Okay, thank you very much, Greg. Um, as Greg indicated, uh, this session is going to be a little bit different than everything else today. Uh, Peter. Um, was kind enough to invite me to talk about a course that I recently developed at Stanford. The title is Valuation in Emerging Economies. And the, you know, sort of the, uh, the genesis of this idea was, you know, for eight years I taught financial statement analysis at the University of Chicago, and it was your traditional FSA class. You talked about ratio analysis, pro forma building, and then ultimately, you know, the implementation of DCF-based models and accounting-based valuation models. And inevitably, during the course of the quarter, a student or two would start to ask, you know, well, that's really interesting, Professor Petrowski, but what if I want to invest in China or what if I want to go back to India and buy a security on the Bombay Stock Exchange? Does this really apply? Are, are all of these tools useful? And the answer is always, well, yes and no. Because when you start looking at firms in the US environment or UK, you, there is a certain level of diligent, due diligence that you have to go through. And the analysis is valid, but we also assume a lot of things. You know, We assume what the regulatory environment's like. We assume that if you're an investor and you hold a security, that your rights are going to be protected and that you know, you're entitled to your cash flows and you'll actually receive the cash flows that you're entitled to. But the minute you move into other settings around the world, the settings that we really haven't talked about today, a lot of those assumptions start to become very tenuous and a lot of problems arise, a lot of complications arise trying to value those firms. And so the course that I developed is I think fairly straightforward and it's basically to provide students with an, with an overview of the transparency and the governance conflicts that exist in emerging markets. And more importantly, given the presence of these conflicts and these, these sort of attributes, how do we incorporate them into the valuation framework or at least try to incorporate them into a valuation framework? And so the class is structured, I think interestingly in my, in my view, uh, the first half is to just talk about the problems, the role of institutions, the role of the environment, how that shapes incentives, and how that ultimately uh, maps into corporate behavior, performance, and the like. And then the second half of the class is more the mechanical side or the quantitative side, and that is, given these problems, how do we now build the pro formas? How do we forecast earnings? How do we forecast dividends, which may differ than the actual cash flows you're technically entitled to? And how do we think about discount rates? You know, the sort of in practice, at least what I hear from the people in practice is, a lot of these emerging market risks, we don't worry about the numerator, we'll just throw it into the cost of capital. Well, that's, you know, kind of an incomplete way to think about it because some of these effects are actually numerator effects. They're cash flow effects and you can actually come up with more precise discount rates if you treated numerator effects as numerator effects. And so the capstone of the course is very similar to a traditional FSA class. It's a real-time valuation project but it's done in an emerging market setting and it's done with a per particular perspective. It's a publicly traded firm and you're going to take a position as a minority shareholder. And the reason I say minority shareholder is it's very easy to assume you have a controlling interest because you can kind of wash away a lot of the problems. But the reality is a lot of us are not going to be able to be controlling shareholders and instead we're going to be like the, you know, the individual who picks up their E-Trade account and says, you know, I want to buy a share of such and such company on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, how much should I pay? And so that's the sort of the, the basic outline of the course and it's designed to integrate everything we would normally cover in an FSA course with all of the corporate finance and international finance and uh, microeconomic topics that are sort of relevant for these emerging market firms. I think it goes without saying the reason this is interesting, at least I shouldn't say interesting, the reason that it's relevant is emerging markets are becoming more and more relevant in society. Um, as, of, as of 2007, foreign direct investment into emerging markets came to about $300 billion US. Um, it's a sizable number, at least from my perspective. Obviously it's small relative to the market cap of say the you know, US exchanges, but it's still a material amount. Um, the allocation of funds, it is global, but it's really concentrated in three settings. It's Asia, it's, it's Eastern Europe, 
and it's uh, Latin America, South America. Very little actually flows to, you know, to Africa or even Southeast Asia, countries like India. And instead, it's going to China, it's going to Mexico and Brazil, and then it's going to Russia and sort of the Eastern European company, um, countries. The other reason why it's relevant is emerging markets themselves are growing, and they're growing faster than domestic markets. And in the last 10 years, we've seen the, the amount of economic output attributable to earnings mark, to, earn, to emerging markets jump from 40 to 46 percent of the global economy. That number is only going to rise as India continues to develop and as China continues to develop. And so this increase in activity, this growth is obviously attracting investor interest and it's just going to fuel future foreign direct investment as well as fuel um, you know, investors' desires to own these securities um, in these marketplaces. So. What I want to do for the sort of the remainder of today's talk is, is really discuss what are some of the key issues that you're facing if you're an investor uh, of, of a publicly traded firm in an emerging economy. And I think obviously um, the source of the problem, or at least my perspective, the source of the problem is the fact that the institutional structure of these economies are just different than the environments we typically think of when we think of Western European markets, the UK or the US. And what you typically are facing uh, is sort of a, sort of a two-headed problem here. The first is the legal systems and the regulatory systems tend to be weak, poorly developed, or if they're developed, the rules aren't really enforced. And then you have another problem, that is there tend to be very strong political forces in play. And what these institutions end up creating is an environment where you have limited protection of rights, whether it be the investor's security rights or just general property rights. You have increased risk of expropriation of assets or, or cash flows simply because there aren't um, protections in place to prevent it from happening. Plus, we'll see some of the organizational structures actually facilitate this expropriation. We also tend to see you know, rampant corruption, rampant cronyism, a lot of that being the result of the political forces sort of being unchecked in these economies. And what ends up happening is sort of this, this, this mix of bad attributes then leads to some sort of developmental problems. You tend to see very limited financial development in these marketplaces. You have, you have, if, you, if they even have an equity market, it tends to be inefficient, you know, however you want to define that. You tend to have a lot of illiquidity. Um, there's a lot of dubiousness about whether or not the bid and the ask prices are really representative of fair value. And so you just have a general level of limited um, financial development. Now at this point what you see is that the primitive institutions are really shaping sort of the form of the contracting environment and the investing environment. That has a ramification now for both you as an investor as well as the firm itself. I mean from the investor perspective it's pretty easy to see what the problem is, right? You're going to enter a setting where you could potentially be fleeced and as a result you realize, or at least you should realize, that there are these country level institutional risks that you'd have to bear and as a result you may discount your investment because of that. You're also going to realize that even if you don't get fleeced, let's say you buy a security and the firm pays you the dividends like they're supposed to, because of the nature of the marketplace, once you buy the share, it may be very difficult for you to turn around and sell the share at a later date. Well, that's an issue that you're going to have to think about in, during the course of the valuation because you're not going to want to pay a premium for something that is not easily transferable. So that's it from the investor's perspective. From the firm's perspective, you have this bad environment, weak contracts, uh, or inability to enforce contracts, Limited, uh, limited, um, limited financial development, that's going to hinder your ability to raise capital, to access capital. Because there's limited financial development, you may have to borrow through the banking sector, which may or may not exist. You may have to borrow from state banks, and you may have to pay a higher cost of capital for those funds. Therefore, because of the limited just capital in play and as a result if the cost of capital is higher that reduces your investment opportunity set because your hurdle rate has just gone up. What you basically see is that the firm itself may be constrained because of the limited development that's arising from the institutional structure. So those are two issues that would have to be grappled with. But then it gets even more fun, right? Because now you have this setting in place where there are not a lot of protections. Expropriation could happen. Corruption exists. This environment starts to shape the behavior inside the firm. You start 
creating these firm level incentives and outcomes that are mirroring the environment the company operates in. And so what you see are business strategies and actions that have been shaped by the environment. You see weak information environments arising because there's really no enforcement mechanism or no motivation to be opaque, especially if you're trying to expropriate or you're capable of expropriating. Um, you tend to see asset management, sort of a loose term, uh, being inefficient, meaning you might take investment, um, investment decisions that are less than optimal, engaging in negative NPV projects. You may not dispose of projects in a timely manner. Um, there's a lot of empire building. A lot of inefficiencies taking place. And all of these firm level actions map directly into the cash flows of the company as a whole. And that, of course, will have a direct impact on the valuation you would apply, even without thinking about all these other uh, risks that the investor faces. So that's sort of the overview. What I wanted to do with the remainder of the time to sort of talk about what I kind of call a tale of four firms. I think these are four, com four companies that kind of capture the different types of problems you would face in an emerging market. Um, one is a Brazilian manufacturer of wood flooring products that's traded on the Bovespa, that's Duratex. Another is Dongfeng Motor Corp. It's the third largest domestic manufacturer of automobiles in China. Its uh, B shares are traded in Shanghai. H shares traded in Hong Kong. Uh, Concane Sugar um, Company is the third largest producer of raw cane sugar in Thailand kind of interesting company traded on the Bangkok Stock Exchange, and then Godrej Consumer Products Company, largest producer of soap and personal hygiene uh, products in India, traded in Bombay. So a nice, interesting set of firms that, you know, think about the kind of economies you'd want to invest in. These, I think, are for sort of very representative uh, emerging markets. So let's first talk about Duratex. What would, you, what would happen there? Well, it's an interesting company because it has the classic problem. It's the majority-minority shareholder conflict. It's a company that has a dual-class ownership structure, there's common and preferred stock, and as a result of this structure, we actually end up with a separation of cash flow rights and voting rights. The parent firm, Ituasa, actually owns and provided 42% of the capital that the firm um, utilizes, um, has 42% cash flow rights. But because of the nature of the holdings, they actually have 89% of voting rights. And so they effectively have a strong control over the operations of the company and all the decisions, but they're supplying only half the capital. The rest of the funds um, were provided by outside investors. It's a nice situation to be in, right, if you're the controlling shareholder. Now, that in and of itself isn't a problem if there are appropriate mechanisms in place to protect the minority shareholders. But then we start looking into the Brazilian environment and what do we see? We see that they tend to have institutions that are not designed to fully protect minority shareholders. Um, there's limited enforcement of, of investor protections and rights, limited enforcement of contracts, and this, uh, these quotes are all coming from sources like the Heritage Foundation. They have limited ability for private enforcement action, so although there is a, an exchange and although they have security laws, very little information exists or very little means exists to privately enforce some of these arrangements. And then of course they mandate a very opaque reporting requirement. Um, Brazilian GAAP is sort of the norm for most firms on the, on the Brazilian Stock Exchange or on the Bovespa. Um, one of, I think that one of the interesting features of Brazilian GAAP is they don't provide you at least in my view, it isn't a sufficient statement of cash flows. You have sort of a flow of funds statement, but when you look at it, you really, there isn't enough information there to do a true DCF analysis, or more importantly, to figure out what's being invested in and what's the return on the investment. So at sort of the country level, the institutions allow for expropriation to take place and allow for inefficient behavior to take place. Now, inside the firm, you know, a firm can try to engage in actions that will alleviate some of these country level effects. You know, Steve talked about engaging in a cross listing. That's one way that potentially they could have overcome some of these weaknesses. They could also just voluntarily try to improve their corporate governance. Um, but Duratex, though, didn't really do this. For example, they voluntarily selected level one corporate governments, governance on the Bovespa. Sounds good, right? Voluntarily selected a, a level of governance. The problem is there's also a level two and a level three. And what they did is they voluntarily chose the lowest form of corporate governance that the exchange would allow. That should be a signal, right? It's telling you that they're not going to put in place a structure that's designed to protect the rights of investors that's designed to perhaps have a more efficient firm. Similarly, they have a board of directors like most firms. I think it consists of 11 members. Um, of that board, you have, you know, of course, complete independence, right? Seven of them are senior executives from Ituasa, which is the parent firm that owns 89% or controls 89% of the voting shares. The remaining members consist of 
family members who are the actual owners of Ituasa, as well as a local politician who, of course, is related to the ultimate product that they sell, which is wood-related products. So all you have left is one independent person. It's a professor. So I think that speaks well for our profession. Although I'm very skeptical, I'm sure there's something fishy here because their specialization is international trade and the company is just about to begin exporting to the US. So I'm sure that has something to do with the trade barriers that currently exist in the economy. So an interesting set of, set of corporate governance attributes. What does it ultimately result in? Weak country level attributes, weak internal attributes. You basically have a firm where the controlling shareholders, the owners, can um, consume the private benefits of control. And in the case of of Duratex, here are the ones that we think we've been able to identify by looking at financial reports, et cetera. First of all, top management earns excess wages. Um, you look at what their peer firms tend to pay for salaries, compare that to what Bovespa reports, and what you have is effectively funds getting taken out of the pool of free cash flows in the form of wages to all of these executives who, of course, have shares in the company and are part of the controlling shareholder group. You also have a lot of favorable, we have a lot of um, intercompany transactions between um, Duratex, the subsidiary, and the parent firm, Ituasa. Another nice way of taking cash out of the publicly traded firm into the family owned firm. Um, because they chose level one corporate governance, there's very little in the way of mandated dividend requirements. As you go through the Bovespa exchange, the higher the level of corporate governance, the higher the mandated percentage of dividend payouts. Um, they, of course, opted for the lowest level possible. So now you don't have free cash flow, it's getting retained inside the firm and what they appear to be doing with these retained funds is by not paying out as a dividend the 58 percent that's supposed to go to outside shareholders they instead reinvested into new activities for which there's very little way for you to monitor what those investments are their latest investment activity is completely unrelated to their primary line of business their primary line of business is to make wood flooring products now they're making bathroom fittings why probably because they have excess cash and it seemed like a nice thing to do. Rate of return, by the way, on that segment was 1% last year. So I would say hardly positive NPV. Um, valuation implications, obviously, all of these actions reduce free cash flow. That should roll into a valuation model. We know from the research that when you have a, a minority sh majority shareholder conflict, control premiums exist, or conversely, there's a discount that should be applied if you're in the minority shareholder. Uh, Love recently estimated that the control premium in Brazil is about 65%. It's one of the largest in the world that she documented. It kind of fits when you consider the, the type of structure that's in place here. Uh, additionally, the fact that there's a wedge between voting, uh, voting rights and cash flow rights also leads to a discount, and these discounts obviously are reflecting sort of the cash flow being squandered. Uh, I'll kind of skip through this other than very quickly. I think a way to think about the, the majority minority shareholder conflict is to recognize that you know the firm can be thought of as being broken into pieces. On the far right, you have what the firm's cash flows would be and what the value would be if it were perfectly optimal. If there were no institutional frictions, if there were no governance conflicts, if there were no agency problems, and then instead the firm, when it's in an emerging economy, can really be thought of in terms of parts. There's the value as operated, which is inefficient. There's the value that's effectively being consumed, I say lost, but it's being consumed by the controlling shareholders. And then there's the value that's being lost just because the institutional framework in the country itself induces some inefficiencies. This could be due to limited financial development, there could be other frictions. But ultimately, if you were to sum them up and get rid of the frictions, get rid of the lost capital, you'd have a, a firm that is, that is optimal. And so when we think about valuation in these settings, the poor minority shareholder is really only entitled to their percentage of the firm as it's currently operated. In other words, those are pro formas that reflect all of the consumption taking place inside the firm. Whereas the majority shareholder is actually entitled to one minus X percent of the firm as reported, as well as all the value that they're consuming outside the financial statements, those private benefits of control. Lastly, you know, we talk a lot about, or I should say, um, 
uh, international finance types talk a lot about well, what happens if a market liberalizes and we can you know, create better institutions, improve the environment. Well effectively what we see here is that value can potentially be unlocked if the institutional environment changes, if you have actual enforcement of securities laws or insider trading laws or, or disclosure requirements. Um, absent that though, that's value that's not accruing to anybody at this point. It's just dead weight loss. And then ultimately when we're thinking about what's the value to a real outside investor, it's sort of the theoretical number right here, less the discount that would arise because of sort of these macro level inefficiencies, market frictions and the like. And so this is sort of the framework that I think of, of, of these, governance conflicts, these governance conflicts in when trying to value a firm. Now of course this is easy to say, very hard to do, but it's certainly I think a way to, to, to approach the problem. Um, five and I got ten at least. So um, <laughs> what we have is some other issues that I think are interesting to the, in the Brazilian marketplace. I'll just talk about uh, one, two, well one really interesting. Uh, another problem that's endemic to emerging markets is just the the essential macroeconomic characteristics of the economy. Brazil historically had high inflation rates and, and just huge volatility in terms of exchange rates and currency devaluations. Obviously as you're building a pro forma in this setting we have to think about what's the role of inflation, how is that going to influence demand, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing with foreign exchange. If there's a lot of foreign exchange movements expected, those have to be built built in to the valuation problem. Okay, company two, Dongfeng Motor Corp. This is my personal favorite, partially because I have a, have a bit of a bias these days. I'm doing some research on China. But this is a firm that also has conflicts, has issues, but the issue here is that it's operating in an economy where there's strong state involvement in the underlying operations um, of the state. And so what do we see here? Well, this is a, a company, as I said, it's the third largest auto manufacturer in China. It is um, approximately 80% controlled. And by the way, I say approximately because opacity. They really don't tell me exactly what the state's ownership interest is or what the majority shareholder's ownership interest is, but I'm inferring from some footnotes that it's about 80%. But basically, Dongfeng Motor Company is controlled by Dongfeng Motor Group, and they own 80%. The remaining 20% is the minority shareholders that float in Shanghai and Hong Kong. Now Dongfeng Motor Group is an interesting parent because it's wholly owned by a state asset holding company. So to translate, it's basically owned by the Chinese government. And so what you have here is a pyramid arrangement where the publicly traded firm is for all intents and purposes controlled by um, the Chinese government and you're going to be buying a share into that into that enterprise potentially. Now the other interesting characteristic is they can't just leave that well enough alone. Most of the financing for the publicly traded firm is supplied through state controlled banks and a financial subsidiary of Dongfeng Motor Group, which is of course the company that's controlled by the state. So what you see here immediately is one easy way for the state to expropriate foreign capital is to just set up a structure of loans that effectively strip interest out of the company. Free cash flows get driven down to zero because it's all being pulled out in the form of debt service payments. And if they can't sufficiently get the capital out that way, well then we'll just set up a lot of intercompany transactions related to sort of supplier and customer parts. I mean this is an auto manufacturing firm. They need tires, they need rubber, they need you know metal. And so of course there's a host of state controlled entities that happen to provide those raw materials. And since those contracts are written you can guess what happens. Ultimately prices can be set that will allow again foreign capital to be expropriated potentially out of the state uh, controlled firm. Sure enough, that's exactly what happens. This is a classic pyramid arrangement that's uh, very, co very common in, in mainland China. Um, uh, Fan Wang and Zhang have shown that there are numerous ways in which money can be tunneled out of these Chinese corporations. Loans and related party tra transactions are the classic examples and they're present here. The other thing that's kind of interesting is when you start thinking about state control or political control is you have to realize that the state is really politicians. They're its individuals. And these individuals have incentives. And what you ultimately see is the firms, their behavior is being shaped by whatever agenda the politician needs to achieve. And it tends to be the case that value maximization is not the thing that 
politicians are rewarded for. Frequently they're trying to do things like meet some form of economic agenda like full employment. And so the firm just hires everybody in the province simply because that's the statistic that they're being judged upon, being critiqued upon. It's not how much cash did the auto company produce this year. And then there's also just the internal capital type, human capital type concerns, reputation. Politicians, at least this is what I'm, you know, I'm sort of learning from my, my Chinese co-authors, is that politicians are really concerned about their own promotion, about their own advancement through the ranks. They want to get as high up into the party system as possible. And so a lot of what they do is just designed to improve their image and their prestige to be able to get to the next position within the province or at the national level. And so as you can imagine, these types of incentives exert behavior upon the firms that they're, they're managing. Similarly, if they're engaged in this form of suboptimal game, what do you think they're going to do? Well, they're going to be very opaque about their activities so that whether it be the citizens or the outside investors can't really unearth or decipher what it is that's happening inside of these, these state controlled entities. And so this financial reporting effect is very prominent in the presence of political forces. And you know, kind of consistent with this, there's a classic paper by Mark Young and you where they basically look at the amount of firm specific information that's in prices and what they find is that countries like China down here tend to have the least informative stock prices simply because these corruption related forces these expropriation related forces, um, lack of rule of law, they tend to exert an opaque tendency upon the, the information environment. What I think is more interesting though is in the context of China and in the context of Dong Fang is that there's actually a bias that's also in introduced. It's not just that the firms want to be, want to, that they want to avoid transparency, it's that they actually want to bias your perceptions about their performance. And there's a lot of, you know, sort of anecdotal evidence about China that politicians don't want to release bad news. It's for fear of loss of face, it's for fear of political ramifications. It started with things like, um, you know, uh, on the health front and the environmental front, we all have heard stories about SARS and, you know, bird flu and that, about how slow they were to release the information. But it also sort of flows into the economic environment. I think the sort of the, the biggest uh, smoking gun, gun on that front is it's pretty much now a common belief that back during the Asian financial crisis, China suffered an economic downturn. But if you actually look at the statistics produced during that time, they were still reporting growth around 9 to 10% annually. And so it's a case, again, of suppressing the bad news. And eventually it comes out, but at a point when it's almost too late to deal with the information. So that, that's what happens at sort of the macro level and the anecdotal evidence. I'm actually working on a paper right now with uh, TJ Wong and Tian Yu Zhang in Hong Kong where we look at, well, what is, what is the incentive at the firm level, a company like Dong Feng? Do they suppress news? Do they try to keep negative news out of the marketplace? And so what we did is we looked at certain political events, events that are driven by political incentives, and asked, do the politicians exert enough influence to prevent the release of bad news? And so we look at one of our statistics is, you know, the likelihood of there being a stock market crash. For a, given, for a given set of firms in a province. And we, we track this likelihood around the political events. And what you'd expect in an environment of suppression is that right before promotion decisions are going to be made, and by the way, promotion decisions are highly visible events. They're kind of like tournaments. It's known about two years in advance when an opening is going to come up and the politicians start to position, them, position themselves for the promotion. It's basically a game within the province or within the country. And what we find is that, you know, up until about a year and a half before the promotion occurs, you see bad news being released. There are crashes, you know, negative, negative news is hitting the marketplace. So it's getting released by the firm. Then all of a sudden, for about 18 months prior to promotion, nothing. And then the promotion's announced and everybody's saying, oh yeah, by the way, we have this, that, and the other to, ter to worry about. And so you have this window of where there's just silence with respect to bad news. Now if I plotted good news, guess what it would look like? Pretty much you're getting it all the time. So you have this asymmetric reporting taking place in response to what's clearly a political incentive. You think that's interesting? Here's my other personal favorite. We looked at the same type of effect around the, around the Chinese National Congress meetings. These are events that are held every fifth year. And they only happen for a month, but there's a big buildup. You know, the president gives talks, new initiatives are announced, and sure enough, year zero or time zero is when 
the Congress meets. And what you notice is in the period before and in the period after, there's a lot less negative news being released than outside these windows. And we actually, if you plot it over the full 12 years for the data we have, you basically see news, 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 tapers off, news, 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 news for five, four more years, and then this lull, and then it picks back up again. I mean, it's literally as if, again, there's some kind of impression trying to be made. Suppression of bad news is one way to continue to attract foreign capital, continue to, to keep interest in the economy, and perhaps keep stock prices up, investment up. So this is a preliminary work, but it's robust to all your multivariate tests and everything. But I think, you know, they always say you should be able to put your results in a picture. I think that's a pretty cool picture. So that's, uh, that's what happens if you invest in China, or at least countries like that. We need to go um, to questions. We'll go to questions. So then there's just one other thing, and then I go to questions. Uh, basically, we want to... Uh, Concane is interesting because it's a commodity firm. Uh, they produce sugar. Uh, one interesting thing, this is a good example of where you have government intervention. The government's basically the principal purchaser of the commodity. They fix the prices, they, they have quotas on imports, and they basically just jerry-rig the entire market mechanism. Thailand is also known for having a lot of corruption in government and a lot of politically connected firms. The big issue here, if you're thinking pro formas and performances, if you're gonna try to value this firm, you need to know how persistent this setting is. Right now, they earn way above average returns. That's only persistent if the political links stay established. How likely is that? Thailand's had 28 coups in the last 50 years. It's uncertain as to whether or not this will continue. And I will leave it there other than to say uh, my message for emerging market investing is caveat emptor. Just go in, know what the problems are, and adjust accordingly. So thank you. You almost had a cute coup there, Joe. I know, I almost had a coup there. I saw that, exactly. Joe, this is, this is fascinating stuff, and I, I know you teach this. Um, As spoken from a co-author, by the way. So. Yeah, <laughs> three papers. <clears throat> so this, this is truly fascinating. The, the one thing that, that struck me in, in, in a lot of these things, and also in that sort of summarizing that equation you have, is you, you take this sort of true economic value and there's a lot of subtraction from that for all these governance related uh, related problems and then you come to sort of the, the, the final value. <coughs> but should we, should we also consider some sort of benefits that these firms uh, enjoy because of the market structure that exists in these spaces? No, yeah, absolutely. Sometimes these firms are sort of filling in institutional gaps. Yeah, I, I know you're absolutely right. I mean, this is obviously the abridged version. And I think part of the actual is we have to remember, firms are, in the, particularly in this setting, the firms are adapting to the environment that they're in. And typically it's thought, it's thought of as being a negative, but in reality, a lot of these firms benefit from the environment that they're in. I mean, in the case of the sugar company, they are politically connected. Therefore, the government actually buys 75% of their product right off the top at an above market price. That's an advantage. They play the game. They make the connections. Whatever they do, they do. And that's something that, you know, given that's a persistent activity, it is something you would build in. Uh, the same is true, um, you know, fir firms do adapt and you would want to take that into account. And one of the certainly. things you had in your Brazil was, was three years for a, to start a new company. Yeah. So there's enormous incumbent power. Absolutely. In, in these. Absolutely. So if, you, if you look at, you know, mean reversion of ROE or something like that, my, my guess is that a lot of these countries, it's going to be far more than... And it so doesn't... Normal profits will last longer than these. Absolutely. It doesn't even have to be the case that you keep incumbents out. It could be just that the state is protecting one business over others. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the companies that we did analyze was Baidu, um, the internet you know, search provider. They have an enormous market share in China. A lot of it has to do with their strategy. A lot of it has to do with the fact that the Chinese government can play games with Yahoo and Google in terms of, you know, you're foreigners, you're not allowed certain information, you're not allowed to access certain uh, clients. And so they can actually allow Baidu to continue its above average rents. So you're absolutely right. And that's a case of where the state involvement, I portrayed it as a negative. It could just as easily, if you're on the right side of the, of the arrangement, it's a huge positive for these firms. The question from the valuation perspective is, is how do you value that? Because you have to assume it's persistent. And so you have to assume what you said, ROEs stick or rate of return stick. So Joe, yeah, when, you, yeah. when you work with your students uh, and have them uh, mm -hmm. address all of these issues. It, it, it seems like it would be a, your handful just to identify all the issues. Yeah. Now quantify them, and I'm curious how much emphasis you put on quantifying them. Mm -hmm. I think about, say, the, the Chinese example mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. where you would almost have to really understand Chinese politics to mm -hmm. understand 
who all the suppliers were and what Absolutely. their incentives are around elections or how much power they have. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you could ever get your handle on hands around that. Some things might be easier, like forecasting a bribe rate or something like that. I'm just curious <laughs> no, as to absolutely. how much work you put in with the students and what your expectations are. Thank no, you. you. You actually, that's, that's, a, that's a very good point. Uh, most of what I look for is the qualitative. It's extremely hard to quantify this. I think you're starting to see that. If they can identify the issues in terms of like grades, they're well on their way to doing well in the class. Um, in terms of, and they still have to come up with some guess. What's nice is, is in the presence of steady state, you can almost look at the, the financial report, I mean, assuming you believe the financial reports, but what they report to you does sort of tell you the net net. It's like this is the profits after a lot of this other stuff is extracted, after they make the bribe payments, after the you know managers consume their perks. We're left with sort of this residual cash flow, and if it's persistent, absent change, that's a good leading indicator of what's going to happen in the future. But yeah, I, I don't hold them nearly as accountable for the quantitative side. Other than there are a few students who are going into this for a living. I actually had a really cool student who was going to go back to Africa and wanted to work on um, the jo work with the, I think it's the Johannes Stock Exchange or in Johannesburg. And he really was interested in the quant side. And so I tried to work a little bit more with him. But it's, it's, in, it's sort of innately difficult to quantify this. It's a lot more about sensitivity and scenario analysis saying what if you know disaster A happened, like all your assets were expropriated, what would value be? Well that's zero, so you provide that some weighting. But that's sort of the extent. Last question, Darius. I'm just interested, what do you tell them about the discount rate? So if, if you look at sort of, you know, all the different practitioner models, all yeah. the different academic models, I'm not convinced we can even get it to, you know, one order of significant digits. That's, right? that's absolutely right. You know, I mean, so. it's, it's a disaster in some ways, the discount rate. And, uh, you know, like in true financial statement analysis fashion, I kind of tell them, you know, you took finance classes, figure out the discount rate. Um, let's focus on the numerator. But the reality is that there's actually a couple issues that there's a couple issues that they can't they can address. One is, is it's pretty easy to deal with the inflation and the exchange rate risk in these economies. And so they can, you know, choose a spot rate method or a forward rate method for the exchange rates and then adjust discount rates sort of accordingly. What's the correct risk-free rate in that sense? They have to rely on some forecasts of those, but that's easily implemented. When you start getting to the governance stuff, I mean, the, the perspective I give them is, you know, the tendency is to say, take a country risk premium and just chug it into the denominator. The alternative view is to say, look, that country risk premium is the result of something occurring. And that something is a probability of expropriation, a probability of the loss of these government subsidies. Why not model out three or four or five different scenarios, assign a likelihood to that. Now that's subjective, but say, you know, here's our base case with 50% likelihood. Everything else has a 12.5% outcome associated with it. And do an analysis that way. Just skip the country premium except to the extent it relates to like exchange frictions. But skip that and instead try to work through that risk through the numerator, whether it be like certainty equivalence or something like that. I just find it interesting when you show them all the asset pricing results, how you know beta is not related to anything internationally, yep. right? You know, yep. sovereign spread stuff doesn't work, and then they start going back and looking at their domestic classes. Why are we yeah. using yeah. FMV yeah. that in the first place? Yeah. Which is why I try to really just take it back to make it as simple as possible and put it all through some variation of a numerator analysis. Joe, some of your students must start to uh, connect your courses after you've pointed that out, and they're going to shortly ask to say, why does anybody invest it? This is a classic <laughs> market for lemon. Yeah, it is. Right. It is. But so, there's so, the, so the obvious question is, I mean, people must not all be losing their shirts. No, they're, they're not. I mean, you've got to remember, it isn't that... Any, every security has a fair price, well, and I you have to just be able to buy them. The problem is... Do, do you ever get them to sort of go back and say, did they gain or lose here? Uh, they've, none of them have actually taken positions or done the, done the analysis no, yet, but no. <laughs> but no, we haven't actually looked. I mean, this is the first, this is actually the first quarter I've ever taught the class. And so I think part of the analysis will be, uh, for their final project, I let them choose their companies with some you know, restrictions. And it would be interesting a year from now or two years from now to look at what their fundamental projections were and compare that. Rents in yep. to be gained. Yeah, here. absolutely. So the, the insiders may be taking practically all of it, but still mm -hmm. being right quite a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much, okay. Joe. Thank you, Greg. I know that all of you are aware of the fact that the beer and wine is already out there, but I need to remind you to please exit via the Coleman Street reception area after 8 p.m. this evening.